You're listening to The Big Picture with Edwin Eisendraft on WCPT 820. Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed that conversation. Um, you know, Tennessee's really important, and we don't think about it as a state in play, but it's got an awful lot uh, of fight in it, and Hendrel Remus is doing a really good job. So um, I was really glad that we were able to have that conversation. But now I, I'm going to welcome back David DeWitt, the um, – David, I'm not sure how to say this. The greatly relieved, um, uh, uh, justifiably proud editor in chief of the Ohio, Ohio Capital Journal. <laughs> Thank you, Edwin. It's nice to be back with you. Well, uh, like I am so proud of Ohioans. This just uh, was a great week, and it wasn't just a win; it was a repudiation. But I'm getting ahead of myself, so remind everybody why there was an election this week, what people voted on, and what happened. Right. So this week, Ohio had a special election to consider issue one, which is uh, an issue that Republicans started talking about in November 2022, right after that election, right after a poll came out showing that 58 percent of Ohioans supported abortion rights. And so what they decided to do was try to change uh, voter power in Ohio that's been in place since 1912. In 1912, citizens in Ohio won the citizen initiative and referendum powers with the simple majority of the vote. And so they decided that they were going to propose to voters to change the threshold from a simple majority of 50% plus one to 60%. And then they also made a change, wanted to make a change, where they would change the number of signature requirements from 44 out of 88 counties, which is already very difficult to achieve, to 88 out of 88 counties, which would have been nearly impossible for citizen groups to achieve. So they wanted to rig the game, essentially. They wanted to change the power of voters to require a 60% majority to change the Ohio Constitution and 88 out of 88 counties, which would have basically killed the citizen initiative and referendum. So we spent... Since then, they had a couple of false starts. They had some contradictions. They eliminated August elections and then had to bring them back for this. And then they spent the summer telling Ohio voters that if we don't do this, our Constitution is going to be attacked in every way you can imagine. And uh, voters needed to strip ourselves of power so that we could protect our Constitution. Well, Ohio voters on Tuesday did not buy any of it. They saw it for the scam that it was. They saw it for the 100-year attack on voter power that it was. And they delivered a whopping 14-point defeat of Issue 1 on Tuesday. Uh, They defeated it 57% against and 43% in favor. And incidentally, that actually echoes the uh, vote in 1912 that Ohio voters took to establish the rights of citizen initiative in the first place. They passed that amendment, giving us this power with 57 percent of the vote. And then in 2023, we protected it also with 57 percent of the vote. Well, David, I I was going to ask, and I hope the answer isn't 100 years, but really, when was the last time a vote was that lopsided in your state? Uh, On a constitutional issue? On Um, any issue. I mean, like for candidates, you guys are close all the time. Yeah, usually in our our race, in some of our statewide races last year, we saw uh, lopsidedness like that, Um, but not all of them. Um, But some of the ones for like governor and whatnot, I think DeWine won by almost 30 points or whatever. Um, Okay. Yeah, so it's not it's not incredibly rare to see that big of a defeat, but that is uh, Dewine spoke this week and he was asked about it. And after on Wednesday, Republicans were finger pointing, they were blame gaming, they were claiming that they didn't have enough time to to create a campaign around this election that they created on a timeline that they chose. You know, um, they were blaming the messaging and all sorts of things except themselves. They weren't really accepting that the people had spoken. But to his credit, DeWine did come out and say, hey, when you see something go down like this, there's no, this just wasn't going to happen. Um, and so he, he at least 
although he is about the only one, he at least acknowledged the will of the voters on Tuesday and said that it's time to move on. A lot of the other people, like Senate President Matt Huffman, he says that he's going to bring this back again. If voters uh, pass abortion rights protections in November, then he's going to bring that back again to repeal that. And Secretary of State LaRose issued an angry, defiant response to the election results. So aside from DeWine, you see most Ohio Republicans have not learned any lesson whatsoever, and they intend to continue to attack voter power. They continue to ignore the will of the people, and they've all but promised to do so. Um, but, but you did see DeWine uh, act like an adult and acknowledge the will of the people. Yeah, well, I mean, I, my, my reaction to that is, this is a guy who wins by 30 points. He knows something about the Ohio electorate. The other Republicans, like, they don't want to learn that lesson? <laughs> okay. I guess fine. not. I mean, if you, yeah, it's pretty, but it's part of this kind of really disturbing pattern that we see where a lot of, especially Republican politicians here, uh, they don't want to acknowledge the will of the people. They don't want to acknowledge the rule of law. They deny the, the results of elections. And... I think that's a very troublesome and disturbing pattern that we're seeing across the country, really, not just in Ohio. But it brings us to a dangerous place because our country is built around the rule of law and the validity of these elections and and people accepting their results and the peaceful transfer of power. So this continued undermining of all of that is just uh, it's a really a really bad sign but it's good to see the voters 57 percent of ohio voters in in what is generally a red state uh said no you won't rip our rights away from us uh you won't confuse us or or the fear mongering isn't going to work we're going to protect our rights and you know a majority said that a majority rules and so that's a good sign and i think that those same types of majorities who value our democracy and value our rights, uh, they really should take a look at these statewide office holders who are still trying to flout the majority uh, will of the people and still trying to call elections into question. And um, I, I think that they, they should hold them accountable for that because that's disturbing and it's not right. And we're seeing Wait, David, way too you, much of it. These days. I want to be sure I understand what you're telling me. People in Ohio aren't saying... This was a fraud election, right? They're not saying that votes weren't properly counted, are they? Uh, no, they. Well, I mean, the Secretary of State, who is the main cheerleader for this, ran the election, so you know he can't come out and say that. But they are saying that voters were confused; they didn't understand the issue; they were manipulated by big money um, interest. Oh, oh, you mean Dick Uline's and money? That type of stuff. The Republican yeah, never dumped yeah. dark money. Yeah, I heard they were complaining <laughs> about dark money while taking it as fast as they could. <laughs> yeah, which which also made it so that, I mean, how are voters supposed to buy that line, you know? Like, when their campaign is entirely funded by an out-of-state Illinois billionaire, and then they're telling people, well, we've got to protect our Constitution from dark money, and you've got an attack on the Constitution from outside money, you know, it, I don't think people were being suckered. They weren't going to fall for it. They tried to run a con job of the voters of Ohio, and the voters said, no, we're not buying it. Well, I, um, and next up uh, in November, there's going to be a vote to protect reproductive freedom um, that would enshrine that in the Ohio Constitution. That is, of course, what the powers that be in Columbus didn't want to happen. Um, but I think the energy on the pro-choice side is going to be um, uh, very real and impressive. Right. So they were pretty open. At first, they tried to deny that this had to do with the November Amendment vote. But then very quickly, they sent a letter amongst themselves that got leaked to the press that said this was all about stopping the abortion amendment rights vote and also stopping further anti-gerrymandering reform. And then by summertime, you had the secretary of state saying this is 100 percent about stopping the November vote. And he was campaigning with the main anti-abortion lobbyist in Ohio doing televised debates on stage next to him. So it was pretty clear that for them, at least, this really was about stopping 
uh, the November vote. And that's because they see polls that have consistently shown that 58, 59 percent of Ohioans support putting abortion rights in the Constitution. So they wanted to raise the threshold to 60 percent to rig the game against that vote. So now we have now that they have failed in that and they got defeated. uh, Now we have a just as we have for the last 111 years, we have voters going to the poll in November and a majority will decide whether or not we put abortion rights in our Constitution. And a lot of the national media you've seen treat this vote as a proxy for that vote. And I think that's true in some ways, but I wouldn't I wouldn't say it's a 100 percent. Uh, proxy estimate because this this had to do fundamentally with with the power that voters had and you saw a wide cross section of people come out and say you know like I know that they're doing this for the abortion member rights vote but this is really this has consequences that extend far beyond that it goes right to the yeah. heart of voter power it's about democracy itself but I will say that this preview election here did give the operatives and the uh, the campaign experts a lot of data on a lot of people where you can see you know suburbia did not go for this um so i think you see a lot of uh women in the suburbs who will probably be targeted for the november vote as well because we saw that they came out and defended their rights over the constitution like this and you saw traditionally red counties that weren't buying into this. And I think in the end, what this really gives is the, the campaign experts uh, a lot of data to analyze for voters to target, regions to target for the November vote. And I think they'll be putting that to a lot of use. Yeah, I was on a call election night organized by David Pepper in Blue Ohio. And, you know, there were lots of out-of-state friends of the state like me who, who sort of were invited to um, cheer you on, right? For what, but like Nancy Pelosi, yeah. uh, came in, Jamie Harrison was there. But but the real energy were the state reps and, and the organizers just talking exactly, as you said, about what they learned and, and, and what opportunities there were to make inroads, even in the most uh, reddest counties. Um, not that they think they'll win everything, but they think that – there's a real chance to tell a different story, maybe put the state in play, and certainly uh, Sherrod Brown's chances up against Frank LaRose look better than they did two weeks ago. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you look at the election map for issue one, it's essentially an election map for how um, Democrats or maybe some of these other type of issues campaigns can win in Ohio. It essentially comes down to Losing by less in some of these red counties. I mean, we saw countless counties where, uh, this, this no vote outperformed, you know, among Trump voters, like Trump voters, Republicans, people like that. So win by less and, uh, or lose by less in the red counties. And then win a lot of these suburban, like Delaware County, north of Columbus, hasn't voted for a Democratic presidential candidate since Woodrow Wilson. Well, they shot down issue one. Um, you saw a split vote in Clark County, Ohio, in Western Ohio, where this issue one failed by one vote, according to the preliminary results. There might be more ballots coming in. You see uh, all along the lake, the northern shore up there, along Lake Erie, those counties that have kind of been bellwethers. You know, a lot of them went for Obama, but a lot of them went for Trump. Um, those are the counties that are going to be targeted a lot. You see a battle still in the Mahoning Valley near Youngstown. So, you know, there's still a lot of residual blue-collar Democrats there who can be swing voters, actually. So I think you look at this map and you see Sherrod's people are probably saying this is the map that we need, you know, and uh, other issue campaigns are saying this is the map that we need. This is This is a blueprint for how we win and who we target in Ohio. Yeah, I mean, I know the National uh, Republican Senate Committee has definitely targeted that seat as one to flip. You know, they they think that oh, Sherrod sure. Brown is a yeah. very, very vulnerable incumbent uh, Democrat in a red state. Um, but I think there's a lot to cheer uh, for for Democrats in this last election. Um, and if Frank LaRose is really going to be his opponent, 
um, I think uh, the dynamics are a little bit different. Yeah, I think, um, well, if Trump is the nominee, you know, there's a lot of Trump support in Ohio. That probably hurts Sherrod. But if LaRose is the nominee against Sherrod, that probably helps him because LaRose really stepped on every rake in the yard uh, on issue one here. And he launched his Senate campaign just two weeks before he just suffered the most crushing defeat of his career as far as something that he put himself fully on for and just got smacked down by voters. So LaRose is a very, he is a, he's, he's an injured candidate right now. He is in, uh, in a lot of trouble in the early weeks of his Senate campaign. So I think, um, that, that gives Sherrod some opportunities here. And then on the other side, I think just for Democrats overall, I mean, as you know, in politics, the hardest thing is coalition building and then keeping that coalition together. So they've built an enormously strong coalition coming out against issue one here. And it really started coming together during the gerrymandering that we saw in Ohio in 2022. They started to, you know, you could see the Republican Ohio politicians just really kind of going anti-democracy full bore. And that brought a lot of people together. It came to a climax here with issue one. And so if they can keep that coalition together and they can leverage it effectively, um, that's going to do a lot of work as far as the organizing level of politics that can be very difficult. That's going to help a lot as far as maximizing what they can do in the future, I believe. Have the Republicans learned any lessons about their anti-democratic, and I mean small d, anti-democracy uh, uh, habits? I don't think they have learned a single lesson from this, except maybe that they haven't tried hard enough. Yeah, it's funny because, you know, they kind of they kind of give their thinking away when they come out and say, like, oh, well, it was just voters were confused. They were manipulated. It's all this dark money. And meanwhile, they poured all their own dark money into it. But it just it reveals that they have this mentality and it's very condescending attitude. I think voters are I'm offended on behalf of Ohio voters if they're not offended, because it's very it's a very sick kind of condescending attitude. It's like, oh, no, y'all y'all are too dumb to think for yourselves about your own rights and powers. If we just throw enough money at you and we confuse you enough and manipulate the message and tell you to be afraid of this and afraid of that and afraid of what's in the closet and under the bed, then we're, we'll, we'll manipulate you enough into doing whatever it is we want. And that's a really sick kind of antisocial type of attitude to take. So I think voters should be offended that that's how they think in the first place. But um, it reveals that to them, it's not a matter of right and wrong. It's not a matter of democracy or uh, caring about the ideals of the American Republic that have really been pillars for us since the beginning and that we've always strived to live up to. They don't care about any of that. It's purely cynical. It's purely a power game. How can we lie, cheat, manipulate, steal from people and to giving us what we want, despite whatever is good for them? And I think that it's, it's a disturbing type of attitude that you see way too often in people of power and trust. And we would all be wise to, you know, turn our backs on these grifters and con men. And, you know, character is important in public leadership, especially. And I think uh, hopefully we get to the point where character starts mattering to a lot more people because uh, these these people really, they're arrogant and condescending. They think they can get away with anything if, if they just manipulate people enough. And yeah. uh, I think it's sociopathic. Um, the, in the last year, the Republicans in your state put partisan labels on Supreme Court candidates and won a Supreme Court election. Um, uh, but I think there's another Supreme Court seat up soon. Um, and uh, I think that'll be fought hard. Um, I want to talk about that with you, get your take on that. And also the former uh, Republican uh, uh chair of the Supreme Court, she left the court um, to fight for an end to partisan gerrymandering. And I'm wondering, what's she doing? Yeah, so as far as that goes, um, 
we have three races in the uh, 2024 Ohio Supreme Court. And so uh, two are up for re-election who were re- elected in 2018, both Democrats. And then uh, one was an appointment from the governor for a seat because another Republican took the chief justice's seat. She won that race last year. The chief justice, Maureen O'Connor, who you're referring to, was forced into retirement due to uh, Ohio age um, mm-hmm. requirements. So she was forced to retire, but she was the swing vote on all the gerrymandering. Remember, we had seven bipartisan Ohio Supreme Court rulings shooting down their gerrymandering that Republicans did in 2022. And they went over their heads. They went to a federal court and had two Trump support, uh, Trump appointed justices say voters have to use these unconstitutional maps because they ran out the clock. So Maureen O'Connor and others are now going to be introducing, and they, uh, they've confirmed it here toward the end of this week on Friday, it came out, that they're going to introduce uh, a new anti-gerrymandering reform for voters to consider that will kick the politicians out of the process and establish an independent commission to draw maps so that we actually have fair representative maps in Ohio. As we've seen across the country, independent commissions aren't perfect, but they're much better than when you have politicians drawing their own seats because politicians are just going to manipulate it and do it for power like we said well like we've seen in ohio even forcing going so far as to force us to vote under unconstitutional maps so that's their effort now and a lot of importance will hinge on the 2024 supreme court races not just for what happens with gerrymandering but also what happens if voters pass this november abortion rights amendment that could be interpreted radically different by different makeups of the Ohio Supreme Court, you know? Mm. Um, So those three races in 2024 are going to matter to the lives of the people of Ohio just as much as anything on the ballot in 2024. Yeah, it's hard to organize around the Supreme Court race, um, but Wisconsin did it successfully a few months ago. Um, And I, I, I just see the energy coming out of this last, uh, this special election, not giving up and the determination of people all over the state to make these issues clearer to voters. I have some hope for Ohio. Yeah, we, we will see. Um, I, you know, I always say I always expect the worst, but I think there's uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity here for these, uh, these organizers, these coalitions, and these are broad based bipartisan coalitions um, to really affect a lot of change as long as they leverage their power uh, correctly and smartly. And, and they do, all of the hard work that still needs to be done day after day and month after month and cycle after cycle. Um, but there is an opportunity here. People are energized, absolutely. And if they can capitalize on that energy and turn it into more election results, then we could start to see representative government come back to Ohio. And it would be very refreshing because we haven't seen it in a long, long time. I mean, but David, it's also helped that um, Ohio's beginning, like, across the country to see some of the benefits that are coming from um, the last, the Democratic Congress, the 117th, and the infrastructure bill and others, right? But they're beginning to see investment in the state. Oh, yeah. Broadband access in rural areas. We've gotten hundreds of millions for that, which is, I was a local reporter in Southeast Ohio. I know what type of barriers that lack of internet access can cause for different communities. And so we're seeing that. We're seeing roads and bridges projects. We're seeing an influx of money for various programs to help with housing and food assistance and whatnot. You know, I, I think if the message of what good that that's doing is out there and people understand how they're benefiting, then um, people will appreciate it. Uh, and, and the question is, of course, how much, how much do they know? Yeah, exactly. So part of the Democrats, right. I mean, I know J.D. Vance will show up for every ribbon cutting, right, and nothing to do with any of it. Yeah. Um, right. It, uh, I mean, so we want to be able to make people understand where it came from and what obstacles had to be overcome in order to bring these benefits to the people of Ohio. 
parlor game among journalists in Ohio is looking at DeWine's press releases whenever he announces a new program. Oh, we've got $5 million going to this community for this project. And he has five paragraphs talking about how great it is. And then at the very bottom, he says, you know, these funds are coming from the American Rescue Plan Act, <laughs> which he opposed, you know, and our entire congressional delegation opposed the Republican side. Yep. Um, and so it's just kind of funny, like, and occasionally he gets asked, like, you know, uh, you opposed this. You said you wouldn't have voted for it. And yet here you are sending press release like at least once a week um, talking about what a great thing it is that we have these, this money. So, um, yeah, I think the Democrats, as far as their comm shop goes, um, they 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 would want people to understand that this money didn't fall out of the sky. This this came from a Democratic president working with the Democratic Congress. Yeah, I mean, Jim Jordan doesn't show up and take credit for him, does he? Um, no, I mean, Jim Jim Jordan's running his circus. He's running his freak show circus on Capitol Hill. I, he, yeah. yeah. (laughs) He's He's just making a two and a half himself. No, I mean, he did talk about stepping on rakes. Every time he holds a committee hearing, he just, he, if you're really paying attention to the facts, you understand that he has none on his side and he's yeah. just being a performer. Well, David, I, I, I'm glad we got to catch up. I wanted uh, to congratulate you and, um, and everybody in Ohio. I just think, um, again, the whole country seems to be moving from defense to offense against this autocratic overreach. And you were ground zero this week. And I know you have worked tirelessly to make sure the voters of Ohio knew what was at stake. So congratulations. Thank you so much, Edwin. I'm very proud of Ohioans for standing up for ourselves and and accomplishing this because it really was fundamental. It was historic and and. They refused to be suckered, and they stood up for ourselves. I'm very proud of Ohioans in Ohio right now. So thank you for having me on to talk. Always nice to talk to you. You bet, David. All right. um, We'll take a quick break. When we come back, um, we'll turn to Wisconsin and other things. Stay tuned.